When was the last time you thought about rewarding yourself? We're all really good at rewarding the other people in our lives, like saying thank you, good job, well done, have a really great day. But the inner dialogue we have with ourselves usually has a totally different tone. Well, that was stupid. Why'd you do that? That's ugly. That didn't work. Sound familiar? Which is more likely to get a positive response from other people? Number one, of course. So do you think we'd get better results from ourselves if we rewarded ourselves more often? So I want you to think about rewarding yourself. Giving yourself a Cersei at the end of the five-day challenge. The inner dialogue we have with ourselves changes when we reward ourselves. All too often, there's that critical voice in our head that tells us we can't do that. We're not good enough. It'll never work for us. It might have worked for her. It won't work for me. And I've seen that play out this week in the comments that people have left about their own work in the free Facebook group. So I want you to stop that. It holds you back. And I want you to think about how you can begin to approach talking to yourself in a more positive way. That is one of the crucial parts of developing a new habit in almost anything you do. So let's reflect back just a, a minute here on what we've covered so far this week. First of all, we talked about the importance of creating that solid painting practice and what it does for you overall in creating a painting or really an art practice itself. So there are three legs to that stool. Remember that? And the first is that you're going to have that solid painting practice where you show up on a regular basis so that you can make awesome work by painting and flow. The second leg of that sustainable practice is identifying your success path and then knowing what business strategies and resources you need to get there. So don't tell yourself you're not good at business or that artists can't do that because that's not true and I call BS on that. The third thing is to feed your imagination, to work on developing the creative living side of your life. If you don't ever put anything back in, you won't be able to put it out. So no input, no output. You've got to address all three areas. But at the foundation is making that awesome work. And it's not going to happen unless you show up on a regular basis and don't wait around for inspiration. So by developing a painting habit, which we've been working on all week long, then you are set to create that awesome work. So remember the painting habit is not necessarily doing a 20 minute painting a day. That's an exercise to jumpstart you and get you in the habit. Begin to work on that process. It could end up being just a warm up you use once or twice a week. The habit that you need to be in is to paint every day that you eat. So I want everybody to have that ingrained in their brains by the end of the five day challenge. Paint every day that you eat. Do something towards your painting practice every day, even if it's just working in your sketchbook. When you do that, when you take small blocks of time and build them together over time, you'll find yourself making amazing progress, but it won't happen until you start seizing those small blocks of time. So to create that habit, we talked the first time about cues, cues and triggers. And remember, cues are the signals that you make to your brain that it's time to set down and get to work on whatever that new habit might be. And you want to appeal to those five senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Stack those cues together and they form a routine. That's what we talked about yesterday. Routines are repeated patterns of cues. And when you repeat them often enough, guess what? You have a new habit. So we want to cement that habit by repeating those cues over and over often enough and then rewarding ourselves at the end. So now we're to the reward part. And I want you to think about the kind of dialogue that we tend to have with ourselves. 
And I ran into this and really kind of realized the impact of it the first time back when I was training with my horse because my trainer pointed out to me that when I had a negative thought in my brain, when I was saying to myself and to the horse in essence, don't do this behavior I didn't want him to do, don't do whatever it was, that my body and my brain registered that as a positive and it became do whatever it was I didn't want him to do. That's not productive. And what it means is our, our brains don't process the don't, the N-O-T. It only processes the activity that we're trying to not do. So if you set up this train of voices in your head that tell you, don't make the mark over there, don't be so tight, don't, and then fill in the blank with whatever else it is, that's actually what's going to happen. Because you're going to get so tight and so tense that you won't be able to relax enough to let the good stuff happen in your paintings. As soon as I started to let go of that voice, magically my horse didn't do those negative things anymore because I was actually stopping that negative programming that was making me tense up in my body and make the things I didn't want to have happen actually be exactly what was going to have happen. It's not woo, it's not magic, it's physiology. It's the way our brains and bodies are connected and the way that the limbic system translates that into how our bodies respond. So let's retrain ourselves. Negative reinforcement does not help. So when you have that voice going on in your head that says all that negative stuff, you are not helping yourself. So shut it down. One way to shut it down is to give it a name and tell it to go away. Just give it a name that you don't like or a name you think is silly and then call it by that name and tell it to go away. Shut it down. Another way to shut it down is to think about, try to consciously, intentionally set that more positive intention. So that's where the reward comes in because we are critters and I've trained horses and dogs, children, and college students as well as adults and sometimes myself and we all respond better to the same thing positive reinforcement that's the reward so when you tell yourself if I get up every morning for five days this week and go for a long walk and exercise I'm going to take myself to a movie at the end of the week that I've been waiting to see you're going to haul that movie in your head as a reward and a goal that you're going to give to yourself at the end of the week when you've achieved that, that set of outcomes that you wanted to get to. Same thing with painting. So I want you to think about a reward that will help you get to the end of the challenge and continue on beyond. So think about what you're going to do for yourself on Tuesday when the challenge is over to reward yourself for having participated. Think about something especially that's in alignment. Alignment's really important. And what I mean by that is if you are giving yourself any old reward, that'll help. Like, I'm going to give myself an iPad if I finish the challenge. Not particularly in alignment. It's a reward. It's kind of a big reward. And it might be a... a a bit of a motivation, but it's not going to do as much as if you tell yourself, if I get through this activity and finish it, I'm going to buy myself that new paintbrush that I've been looking at in the art supply store for a month. Do you see how that's in alignment? That alignment is one of the things that guarantees that the activity is going to continue. Because your brain tells yourself, I'm going to get a goodie that's going to help me keep on going. And then you give yourself another goodie for the next block of time and then on out. And the goodie you're giving yourself, the Cersei as we call it here in the South, the Cersei you're going to give yourself just adds fuel to the fire of forming that habit. So make a list for yourself today. Post it into the Facebook group if you want to. But think about creating a list 
of things that you can reward yourself with that will help you cement this painting routine beyond the five day challenge. Then pick out the one you wanna use on Tuesday to give yourself that Circe for finishing five days of painting. But I really would recommend that you think of more than one. I would think of three or four or five things that are in alignment with what you're trying to accomplish that you can pass on to yourself for achieving that accomplishment. That's how you're gonna get into alignment. That's how you're gonna be able to cement that habit or routine. And that's how you're gonna be able to continue to reward yourself for moving on and achieving those goals. So I wanna make sure that I'm also checking here to see if we've got any questions coming in and to make sure that the live stream here is continuing to go since I had trouble with it cutting out on me mid-broadcast yesterday. I think we're going to be fine because I have hooked it up a little bit different way today. But I'm going to hop in here as well and just double check on any questions that might be coming in. So if you have a question that comes up while I'm talking, go ahead and type it into the comments. And I'll scroll through these as we, we either come to a spot where I can pause or if it's something that's really right on target with what I'm talking about, I'll stop and answer it right then as well. So check in if you have a question. You do not have to wait. And oh my, I just noticed that the daggum camera is projecting the wrong way. So hang tight for just a second here. And I Nothing like being beset by tech challenges this week. Luckily, I'm also filming it on the uh, same time, so I can weave those together later. Thank y'all for looking at the talking painting there. So it should be flipped around, and if you can see it correctly now, let me know that it's showing correctly. I think it's working, and... There it goes, it looks like it's turned now. Yeah, it was using the wrong camera, Ken. You're absolutely right. Susie, you should be seeing me, but it was um, flipped the wrong way. I think I've got it now. So, so Diane knows what a Circe is. Yeah, Circe's are presents, small presents. And they're usually presents that you're not looking for that just kind of happen. So I used to ask my mother to bring me a Circe when she would go to the grocery store. So I want y'all to Circify yourselves. Get yourself a Circe. Circe's are just little gifts, and we don't give ourselves gifts often enough. So make sure that you're going to gift yourself something for the end of the challenge. And the main reason is, again, that you're going to create and get better results if you program that positive reinforcement into your practice rather than the negative. So let's go through that habit loop again. We've got cues, and those are the triggers. And remember, the, the things that I talked about that I use in creating that habit loop are, um, first thing, walking into a separate space. Now, you may not have a separate studio in your home, so think about how you can incorporate space into that. That you're walking into a specific place that you use all the time to paint. So don't paint moving all around the house. Go to the same spot each time. Even if you have to take your stuff down and put it away and bring it back out again, painting in the same place will help form a cue. So moving into this, uh, the studio is visually different for me. And I have my stuff here. That makes a big difference. So that's sight. Then there's sound and smell. So let's talk about smell. Remember I make coffee and the coffee has an odor, a scent that I associate with making art, with being in the studio and painting. And the taste of it also reinforces that. Then I play music. And it's not that I never listen to that music any other place, but I kind of have a playlist that I use when I'm painting. It helps me to get in the mood. Then we have that Going back to the taste, that was the coffee, and the smell, and the touch. 
I love to mix, not just love, but from actually it is just the experience part of it. I like to mix my paint ahead of time. It's part of the process of getting into flow. So I mix all of my colors ahead of time and the actual act of mixing the paint, the tactile quality of the paint helps make me want to paint. Now there's some strategic reasons for doing it as well so that when I look at the palette and if it looks ugly, I know that I still need to work on it before I start painting. If it looks good on the palette, it's going to look good on the painting. I figure out all of those issues before I start to paint. Because remember, we only have so many conscious decisions we can make in a day. We want to remove as many of those as possible around the painting process so that when we get ready to paint, we can paint in flow. We're not having to make these huge big decisions that are like a brick wall to the flow process. So cues form routines when you repeat them over and over again. And when you add a reward at the end of the routine, it creates a, a real positive feedback loop and helps to form and solidify the habit. So it's not a habit until you've repeated the routine often enough for it to become ingrained. You can use verbal rewards. You can tell yourself good job if you want to. You can write it down in your journal every day. But you want to focus on that practice and not the performance. Focus on the benefits, not the individual paintings. So I've seen some people worrying in the group about whether their painting is good enough. That's not the purpose of the exercise. Remember that a 20 to 30 minute painting may not be finished in your, your way of thinking. For some people it is. But the purpose of it is not to produce a finished painting in 20, 30, or even 40 minutes. The purpose is to begin to shut down that negative Nelly voice that tries to take over. And having that small block of time to work in helps to do that. So give yourself the chance to make some paintings that don't have to be perfect. One of the things that I commented on yesterday in the Facebook group was about failure and about the necessity of failure. It's something I actually made a video about during the last challenge because some people were beating themselves up too much and going down that road towards the negative um, reinforcement, which does not do a whole lot for you. And you need to think about failure in a different way. I used to ask my students at the college how many times they'd failed the week before. So on Monday morning when I was teaching the freshman um, course that was all around strategic planning and goal setting and being successful in college, I would ask them, what did you try last week that you failed at? Because if you haven't failed at anything, then you haven't gotten out of your comfort zone and stretched. We have to fail and fall flat on our faces at times and realize the world does not end. Pick ourselves up and keep going. So you need to fail often, fail fast, and fail forward in order to keep moving. And as one of the community members said yesterday, failure is an opportunity to grow. And I loved that because he's spot on right. When you make something that doesn't work, that's a chance for that reflection and adjustment to come in that we talked about earlier as being the last part of the habit loop. So you can't have that adjustment happen unless you have attempted something. If it doesn't work out, failure doesn't mean that you're a bad person or that you can't ever do this or you'll never be a success. It means you tried something and it didn't work out this time. What can you do to make it work out next time? Then you reflect on it, you adjust your process, and you try it again. Everything is a test. Think of it as a test. And when you do that, it removes the fear of failure. Because failing just means you're trying something. And then you can tweak it and adjust it and go for it again. And lo and behold, before too long, you've been successful. And every time that we're successful, it builds on itself. And then the next time, we're not as afraid of failure. So um, one of my favorite stories about failing forward 
It's another horse story because most of mine go revolve around horse stories. So I was learning how to ride bareback again. I rode bareback as a child, like lots of kids. But by the time I was learning to do it again, I was in my 40s. And there was a lot of fear associated with that. Ironically, a lot of, and I'm sure everybody can relate to this, was looking stupid in front of people. Because here I was, I'd grown up riding and I'd stopped and then come back to it. And there were going to be other adults around watching me attempt to get on the horse bareback. So there was the fear of looking stupid. There was also the fear of what if I fall off? Well, that got alleviated by the fact that it was a real sandy arena with really deep sand. If I fell off or slid off in the process, the only thing that was going to be hurt was my pride, nothing else. So I sat on the rail, on the fence, my wonderful patient horse standing in front of me, ready for me to throw a leg over. And I vacillated back and forth and back and forth. Do I throw a leg over now? Well, I might slide off and then I'm going to fall and I'm going to look stupid. And all those people on the other side of the arena are going to laugh at me. And I sat on the fence and then I sat on the fence some more. That's where that phrase, that saying comes from, sitting on the fence. It means you're not taking action. You're not going forward. You're not going back. You're just prevaricating. You can't do that forever. You have to throw a leg over. You have to risk falling. And you have to risk looking stupid. Think about what the worst thing that can happen is. And that's what I did for myself. I thought about the worst thing that can happen. Well, I might push off so fast that I just go all the way over the horse and end up in the sand on the other side. Well, am I going to die? No. Am I going to break a leg? No, because I'd learned how to fall off. So what was holding me back? Just the looking stupid part. Well, I thought I look really stupid sitting on the fence. So probably that's not going to increase. It's only going to decrease. So I threw my leg over the first time with such force that I went all the way over the horse onto the other side and into the sand. The worst thing that I had contemplated to happen did happen. Nobody laughed. Nobody made fun of me. I got back up off the ground. My horse did look around at me and go, really? But I got up, brushed the dirt off, got back up on the fence. And this time, I had a better idea of how much force I needed to use to throw my leg over. So I got up my nerve, threw my leg over a second time. And this time, I didn't fall off into the dirt. This time... I'm on the horse's back. I have the lead rope in my hand and we're ready to trot around the arena. And instead of people making fun at me, I got a cheer from my friends sitting on the sidelines. That's what happens to all of us when we get up the nerve to throw a leg over, risk falling in the dirt, pick ourselves up, make an adjustment, and then do it. Go for it. But we cannot sit on the fence forever. So think about what it is that you want from painting and what it's going to take to help you figure out how to throw a leg over and go down that success path. I want you to think about how you can achieve what your dream is for your painting. And shut down that negative Nelly voice that says, it's not possible, it can't happen, no way, no how, you don't have what it takes, you're too old, you don't have the skills, you didn't have the degree, fill in the blank with whatever else that voice tells you. And in fact, that might be something else you want to do today to help silence the negative Nelly, is just empty all of that garbage out of your brain onto a piece of paper. And even share it with some other people so that it goes away. And you realize that the worst thing that can happen is you end up in the sand, you brush yourself off, pick yourself up, and get back up again and try one more time. But this time with a little bit more information. So does that resonate with y'all? Does that make sense? Let me know if it does. And I want you to know that we're going to be talking about this in addition to how to make those adjustments, how to, to do that sort of self-reflection 
and to analyze what worked, what didn't work, how to incorporate some other things, and then how to apply what you've learned in the challenge to those other two areas of building that successful painting practice. So let me dive in here and see if anybody has any questions right now and make sure that I am, again, still turned the correct way here. Yay, Joan says, I've done that. Exactly, excellent. So let me see if I can see all the comments here. Sometimes Facebook does not cooperate on showing them all. Let's see if I can do it without making the sound turn up on here. And yay. So um, <laughs> Betty Majorca says, how did you know I was thinking about an iPad? Don't do that to yourself. You need to get something else that's going to apply to painting. Although actually, Betty, that is in alignment with what you do. Um, Betty paints a lot with digital paint programs. So in that case, Betty, I actually do think it's in alignment. So you can get yourself that iPad or an Apple Pen or something that's going to help you in that digital painting process. That makes sense in terms of what you're doing. Makes total sense. So let me scroll back up here and get the rest of them. Yeah, Luann, I know y'all could only see the corner of my studio. So you got to see the messy corner too, unfortunately. Blech. When I do the replay for everybody who's on the challenge email list, you're going to be able to see me the whole time because I've got it filming over here on my laptop. So you won't see the sideways Mary or the corner of the studio Mary. Sorry about that. Diane has a question about paint. She says, are the odors from the cadmium paints toxic or just direct contact? The odors of the cadmium paint are not toxic. It's not sending out anything into the air that you need to worry about. The problems with the cadmiums are when you have it get into your skin through an open cut or through it being mixed with solvent. Solvent will help it penetrate your skin faster. So you have to, or if you ingest it. One of the reasons that I preach about not using those toxic or those heavy metals is that a lot of people are not careful about how they handle them in the studio. One of my main mentors in graduate school, one of my favorite people in the whole world, um, was a painter in acrylics. And he used those pigments. And he also painted with very highly meticulously patterned paint. Used a double aught little tiny brush when he painted. And he would bring the paintbrush to a point by sticking it in his mouth and licking it. And then dipping it in the paint, making a mark, wiping it, sticking it in his mouth to bring it to a point and dipping. And he got cancer. Now it wasn't helped by the fact that he smoked, but ingesting that paint over and over and over again, probably over about 30 years, even maybe it was only 20, but that did not help his health. So you want to be really careful with that. When cadmiums and the metals go airborne is when you're using pastels. So people who are working with pastels need to be particularly careful. Pastel dust goes airborne when you're working. And I didn't realize how much it did that until I was working in pastels in graduate school doing big four by six foot drawings. And they were, I was working on them pinned up on the wall. And I kept getting bad sinus infections. And I realized I was breathing in the pastel dust when I put on a dust mask just to see if that helped. And at the end of one session, the dust mask was blue. And I was using all of the colors that you really probably should not be using when I was doing that. As soon as I started wearing a respirator, the sinus infections went away. So pastel dust is particularly problematic. If you're using pastels, get rid of those colors. Do not use them. If you're using pastels, you need to be wearing a respirator so that you are not breathing in pigments. That's not going to happen when you're working with paint, regular paints because they're not airborne in the same way. So you're fine with the cadmiums. Use up what you've got. But then there are better pigments out there that will get you the same effect 
without having to deal with that, that level of toxicity. They've even started marketing cadmium-free paint, which is a total marketing ploy. You can get that anytime you substitute, for example, naphthol red for cad red. You don't need to go to the, the cadmium-free. There are plenty of cad-free pigments out there that are really great. So that is my spiel about toxic stuff. So, yeah, I think I've got it all straightened out. Nah, Betty, I have taught for so long. The tech issues don't tend to fluster me too much. Um, every time I would really try to incorporate high tech, and I'm a tech, techie nerd, um, at the college would be when the whole computer system would go down or stuff like that. You just have to go with the flow and go with the backup. So glad it's semi-working right now. Excellent. Yes, Susie, certify is my verb for the week. I want everybody to certify themselves. Yes. Oh, Joan, no, a snowstorm. That's right. The West and the Midwest has, has really gotten hammered today and this weekend. So if y'all are in a snow zone, great time to paint inside. If you're part of the Artwork Living membership, the paid membership, they were trying to paint from observation and outside. I know a lot of people are painting inside in response to that. You're still painting from observation if you paint out your window. So go to that if you want to. And, oh, Susan says, failed at everything during this challenge. You only fail if you don't learn from it. So think about the, the only thing that was a, a go-to suggestion for the challenge was to work in short blocks of time on a small painting every day. It didn't have to be good. It just had to be done. So if you did that, you've succeeded. You haven't failed at all. So contrary to what I saw some people posting in the group, Painting with a palette knife was no part of the challenge. If you want to, go for it. I use them, but that's me. That was not a rule of the challenge. The only rule of the challenge was to try to make short blocks of time really count towards being productive. So working in a short block of time, doesn't matter if it ends up being 45 minutes or even an hour, but shaving off of that gradually that becomes a success. It's not having a perfect painting at all. So reframe how you think about failure there. Reframe that totally. Yes, Barb, I'm glad that makes sense. So failure is an opportunity to grow. And you only fail if you can't find the opportunity. You only truly fail if you can't find the opportunity in what went south in that, that particular event. Yeah, as Laurel says, every time she paints, she learns something she likes and something she doesn't. Reflect and adjust. I like to recommend that people reflect and adjust at the end of every painting session. So if you work in normally like four-hour blocks of time, which is still what I love doing, I'll do a 20-minute painting at the beginning of that time to loosen up. And then at the end of a painting session, I like to get my sketchbook out and make a note of what I think is working and what I want to adjust the first thing I want to look at the next painting session so that when I come in to paint I know what I want to go to right away and I don't have that well what do I want to work on today kind of thing happening with myself so yes if you haven't watched the the video on failure I reposted it into the free group yesterday so that people could listen to it again. Also because one of the parts of the things that I went over in there was the critique sandwich and how important that is to apply to yourself. So if you haven't heard me talk about that before, and I think this is super important when you start listening to yourself in your head, the critique sandwich has to do with finding something that works in what you've just done first because the positive is way more important than the negative. So find something that works. I like to tell people to find three things that work first. Then find something that needs to be addressed that could be done differently or could be approached in a different way. Don't tell yourself that it's something that's bad that doesn't work. You want to look at an area where you're going to do something differently or approach it in a different way. 
that reframes that negativity into something that's constructive and positive. Then you want to follow up at the end with something else that works. That's why we call it a sandwich. It's like an Oreo. It's got a, a filling in the middle and two cookies on either end. When you frame it that way, you will be more productive. Beating yourself up, or beating anybody else up for that matter, is not productive. I've taught for donkey's ages, and I've never seen anybody make speedy progress through being attacked, whether it's attacking yourself or attacking somebody else. So be super careful how you frame criticism and make sure it's constructive by using the critique sandwich. And the most important person to apply that to is yourself. That's another way to reward yourself. We're going to talk about that more tomorrow when we go to the critique sandwich. So, is it still sideways? Uh, excellent. Betty says, I think of rewarding myself and it's things that are way too expensive. Pick something small, Betty. Think about picking something that is um, small like a tube of paint or a new sketchbook or a special marker that you're going to use in your sketchbook. Think of little things. So open up uh, an online art supply catalog and pick out three or four things from there that will help you. It might be that you're going to pick a new um, journal, a new pen. Think of things that are going to help you move down the process of growing your painting practice. So think of things that can help you along the way. If you are defining your success path, as selling your paintings online. What are some of the things that you could reward yourself with that are going to help you get down the line that way? It might be that you're going to upgrade the camera on your phone. It might be that you're going to purchase like Photoshop elements or something so that it's going to be easier to edit those photos. But reward yourself with something that's going to make the habit easier that you're trying to create. Yes, Laurel. Bingo. I love that. Ants. Oh, that's fantastic. So let me read to y'all what Laurel says. She says, we call them A-N-T-S. Automatic negative thoughts. No one wants ants crawling around their brain. That is fantastic. I love that. That is super helpful. That's a great acronym. ANTS. Automatic negative thoughts that crawl around in your brain. They stop you from moving forward. So just don't do that. And... Ha ha ha. Let's see. Um, Nancy says, what do you use for CAD Yellow? I use Indian Yellow by um, Williamsburg. Indian Yellow is a pigment that is different in every single line of paint. So cat, uh, Indian Yellow and Williamsburg is not the same as Indian Yellow and Gamblin. So Indian Yellow and Williamsburg or in Windsor Newton are pretty close to the same thing. It is a really transparent color, transparent pigment that's the same as in Hansa Yellow but it's transparent instead of having the opacity that Hansa Yellow has. And from that transparent yellow, I can mix all of the yellows, depending on how much white I put in there. Out of the tube with a tiny little bit of white, it becomes a yellow-orange. With a little bit more white, it becomes a cad yellow, medium. With a little bit more white, it becomes a lemon yellow. So that one tube of paint gives me all the yellows. It's almost a pure yellow. I also use yellow ochre because I'm predominantly a landscape painter and it is a slightly cooler towards green yellow that makes fantastic greens that are not quite so um, artificial and neon as if I mixed them with the regular yellow. So that's what I use and it's not toxic. So 
that's the best one I have found. So look for Indian Yellow there. And hey, Margaret Whitten, it's good to see you. Uh, yeah, Diane, you know, I thought about that after I started my story, Diane Overcash, that throwing a leg over it has a slightly different meaning in England. And I am aware of that, but I forgot about that when I started telling that story. So sorry there. Um, idiomatic English, um, pro, uh, colloquial English here has a very different meaning in writing here. So Yes, getting on the horse should be a better term, and even that one has some bad connotations. So I'm just your, your local humorist in training here. Yeah, Betty says she's making notes to self. Yeah, that is a great part of a routine. So if you finish out your painting session with making notes to yourself about what worked and didn't work, that is super, super helpful. And Leslie says, very freeing to realize oils are so forgiving. They really are. That's why when I'm teaching painting, I start with oils, preferably over any of the others, because they are literally the most forgiving medium out there. Next is acrylics. Next is, well, pastels is kind of in the middle there. And acrylics. And then watercolor is the most difficult. And so many people start with watercolor, but that is the hardest one to deal with because it dries so quickly. So yes, oils are incredibly forgiving. It, it makes it so much easier to allow yourself to make paintings that don't necessarily work because you can adjust. Um, Leslie, Hansa Yellow is a pigment name. Hansa is not a brand of paint, it's a pigment name. And you can find it in watercolors and in acrylics and in oils. Different paint companies will label it a little bit different way. A lot of times what you see as cadmium yellow hue is actually Hansa yellow because when they use hue on the end of the color name, it means they've substituted something else that's either cheaper or less toxic. And Hansa tends to be what they substitute for cad. Yeah, Betty, she says, I can get one or two of those big paint pens to quickly put in sketchbook backgrounds that someone suggested online. I forgot the brand. Um, yeah, one more day and you can reward yourself. There are some brands that work really well. I think Derwent makes some and Prismacolor makes a whole line of gray um, markers that are great for working in sketchbooks. I have a set of them right in my office there in the studio and I'm not gonna hop up and go grab those right now, but. I'll try to remember to type them in here before I hop off at the end. They are fantastic. Sigrid says, do oil paintings always need to be varnished? And how long do they have to dry before you can varnish them? Um, they don't have to be varnished. I think acrylics should always be varnished because the acrylic plastic um, paint film attracts dirt and doesn't release it. Oil paintings can be cleaned even if they're not varnished. Um, the, the varnish is there to protect it and to even out the paint surface. So yeah, I think in the long term, it's probably good. I don't always varnish my paintings. I have um, mixed feelings about varnish. So sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. If you use varnish for oil paintings, use Gamblin's Gamvar varnish and watch Scott Galatly's YouTube video on how to do it. Don't use Damar varnish. That stuff is nasty for all kind of reasons. Use Gamvar. Um, with Gamvar, it doesn't have to dry quite as long. The longer you can let it dry, the better off you are. I would give it a couple of weeks before I varnished it. But go to Gamblin's site and they have tons of really fantastic recommendations on varnishing. Um, oh, Susie, don't do that. She says, what about using mist-tinted paint from the hardware store? Lots for less. Here's why you should never paint with paint from the hardware store or home decor store. Paint from the hardware store, whether it's oil-based or acrylic-based, is not designed to be permanent. Most of the tins will say that it's good for, you know, five years, seven years. It is designed to fail. It's designed to only last a certain amount of time before it starts to fade, before it starts to become brittle. And the problem with painting with that kind of paint 
is that your paintings will fall apart faster. So don't use paint from the hardware store. Buy good paint. It's easier to work with. It lasts a longer time. What you can do if you want to save money is buy really good paint, like Williamsburg, like Vasari, like Gamblin, and then use some of the extenders that they make to make your own student grade paint. I don't even recommend that people buy student grade paint because it's junk. It's got a lot of filler in it and it's got inferior pigments. If you buy really good paint and then buy a tube of extender, that's the filler, you can control how much of that is in there and you can actually make cheaper, better quality student grade paint. But stay away from the hardware store for paint. That's not good at all. So Susan says, any advice on transitioning from indirect painting to a la prima? Um, I think the best thing to remember, the most crucial thing to remember there, Susan, is to paint from thin to thick. The biggest challenge I see people have when they start painting a la prima, wet into wet, whether it's with watercolor, acrylic, or oils, is they put too much paint onto the brush at the very initial stage. So you want to work from thin paint to thicker paint, a thinner layer to a thicker layer. When you've got a thin layer underneath, you can then come across with either your brush or your knife with a thicker layer and it won't pull up that thin layer underneath. So thin to thick is the, the name of the game there. So I think I have caught all of the questions today. Thank you all for putting up with my interesting tech challenges. And if you want to see the video without any of the flipping around and the weird angles and the dirty corner of the studio, <laughs> then make sure you're on the challenge email list because I'll be sending out the replay recording with it all in one angle <laughs> before the end of the day. So I want everybody to dive in to day three, four here. And remember, it's not about making a perfect painting. It's about making a painting. It's about using a small block of time and learning to paint in flow. So the things that are going to help you paint in flow are using cues that you stack together to form a routine that you repeat often enough that it becomes a habit. And hold out in front of yourself a reward that you feel is in alignment with what you're trying to accomplish. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for our final, actually special live video. It's going to be a little longer because we're going to talk about not only how you can evaluate and analyze and adjust from what worked and what didn't work on the painting process, but how you can then apply those same things to the success path and the strategies you're going to use to get there and feeding your creative imagination. We're going to talk about the limiting beliefs that hold artists back and how you can kick those to the curb so that we can work on being thriving artists and being, instead of being starving artists. Remember, I'm on a mission to kill the starving artist stereotype. And I want to make sure that everybody is here tomorrow as we begin to come to a, a close on the challenge and talk about how you can really set yourself up for success as a painter. Happy painting, everybody. Tune in tomorrow. See you then.